Greetings. I'm Indu, a postdoctoral research associate in the Department of Plant Sciences. I work on algal carbon concentration mechanism. And in the next 10 minutes, I shall introduce you to my area of research and try to give you a feel for why we think small microbes like algae might be very small, but they're also very efficient in carrying out photosynthesis. So I'd like to begin this talk with a question. What is the basis of all life on Earth? The answer is photosynthesis. Can you explain photosynthesis? Yeah. Yes, we can explain photosynthesis. So what is photosynthesis? It is the process by which organisms like plants and several microbes can harness the solar energy and capture carbon dioxide and convert it to an organic molecule like glucose. And it must be noted that photosynthesis is the only process in the biosphere that converts carbon dioxide to a form usable by living organisms. And it is this converted carbon dioxide as an organic molecule that forms the basis of all life on Earth. And why is that? And that is because all life on Earth is carbon-based. So who photosynthesize? Well, as we all know, it's plants in all forms, be it herbs, shrubs, tall trees, ferns, pines, or plants growing in water. But we, what we might very often overlook is the contribution made by microbes. So there are several photosynthetic microbes like cyanobacteria, diatoms, algae, dinoflagellates that also photosynthesize. And they make a significant contribution to the amount of carbon dioxide that is fixed. So how much do they exactly contribute? So before we go into that, we need to see what is the prevalence of terrestrial photosynthesizers uh, as opposed to aquatic photosynthesizers, which are primarily microbes. So the difference in biomass in terms of their carbon dry weight is, is 200 fold, which is quite phenomenal. So there's 200 fold more of terrestrial plants and photosynthesizers as opposed to aquatic microbes. But how much do they contribute in terms of fixing carbon? Well, the annual net primary productivity is almost the same. It's in the ratio of six is to five for terrestrial to aquatic photosynthesizers, which is pretty incredible considering the difference in their biomasses. So how do aquatic microbes punch about their weight? To answer this question, we'll have to go back to photosynthesis. One of the key steps in photosynthesis is catalyzed by Rubisco. So Rubisco is a protein molecule and the most common form that is seen across all photosynthesizers, almost all photosynthesizers, is a 16 polymer chain assembly. Um, so there are over 50,000 atoms that have to come together in this right conformation to make a functional Rubisco molecule. Rubisco is a catalyst that catalyzes the reaction between carbon dioxide and a five carbon sugar molecule to produce two molecules, each of which contain three carbon atoms. Rubisco is the only molecule that occurs in the biosphere that manages to capture atmospheric carbon dioxide. And its key role in this uh, in biosphere in terms of being able to convert carbon dioxide to an organic molecule makes it pivotal to the biosphere. But since it is the only molecule which carries out this job, 
it also has very little accountability. And when there is very little accountability, there seeps in some corruption. So Rubisco has issues. Well, Rubisco is supposed to catalyze a reaction with carbon dioxide, something that is boring and healthy for the system, like eating kale. But it is very often tempted to react with, to carry out a reaction with oxygen, which results in photorespiration and loss of fixed carbon. But that is tempting. And the reaction with oxygen becomes more prevalent considering the fact that oxygen is far more abundant as opposed to carbon dioxide. 21% of the atmosphere is oxygen, while 0.04% of the atmosphere is composed of carbon dioxide. As a result, Rubisco has a higher chance of catalyzing this reaction with its junk substrate, oxygen. And as a result, photosynthesis is quite inefficient in most organisms. It must be noted that the availability of carbon dioxide is lesser for aquatic microbes, which makes their feat of contributing to the extent to which they do to the annual net productivity even more phenomenal. So how do organisms cope with this issue? So a lot of aquatic microbes have developed a mechanism called carbon concentration mechanism as a solution to Rubisco's promiscuity. So what do they do? So they manage to increase the local concentration of carbon dioxide around Rubisco, thereby shielding Rubisco from seeing too much oxygen. And thereby Rubisco is happy carrying out its usual reaction of um, uh, catalyzing carbon dioxide fixation. This is made even more efficient in certain cases by increasing Rubisco concentration as well in a micro compartment. And it is into this micro compartment that the carbon dioxide captured is delivered in a concentrated manner, thereby re reducing the inefficiency that is introduced into the system owing to Rubisco's promiscuous T and its low affinity for carbon dioxide. So where does this happen in microbes? So here I have examples from cyanobacteria, two cyanobacterial species, and the green alga, Chlamydomonas reinhardtii. So in the first two images that you see here, in Halothiobacillus and Cynococcus, there are these um, spheroid dark um, structures that you see, which are actually micro compartments where Rubisco is kept concentrated, and it is into these compartments that carbon dioxide has to be delivered for fixation. In the case of green alga Chlamydomonas, which is a model system, and it is the model system that I study in my lab, uh, along with several other colleagues, um, the micro compartment is called pyrenoid, which is within an organelle called chloroplast, which is where most of the photosynthesis reactions take place. Uh, in fact, all of the photosynthesis reactions take place. And, uh, and it is in the pyrenoid that the rubisco is kept concentrated and it, is, and it is here that the carbon dioxide needs to be delivered. So how complex is CCM in a, an organism like Chlamydomonas reinhardtii? It is pretty complex involving the participation of several cellular factors. As one would expect, um, CCM is dependent on light because it is happening in conjunction with photosynthesis. And it also responds to the availability of carbon dioxide. It must be noted that Chlamydomonas grows in water. And in water, carbon dioxide converts to an ionic form like bicarbonate. So what is available to the algal cell very often is more of the bicarbonate rather than carbon dioxide. The ratio of bicarbonate to carbon dioxide, again, will depend on environmental factors like pH and temperature. So the cell needs to be able to respond to these various physical cues and have its cellular machinery in tune so that it can carry out 
CCM and photosynthesis efficiently. The carbon dioxide from the external environment or bicarbonate, the inorganic carbon source, needs to be transported into the cell. And this is accomplished by transporters on cellular membrane, the expression of which may not be happening at all times. Um, it'll only happen in, in several cases, the expression of these transporters will be triggered when there is a need for establishment of CCM. There also need to be transporters on the chloroplastic membrane, the organelle in which all photosynthetic reactions take place. Ultimately, the inorganic carbon needs to be delivered to the pyrenoid, the microcompartment where rubisco is kept concentrated. The microcompartment also has a carbonic anhydrase, an enzyme which ensures that bicarbonate is converted to carbon dioxide because one needs to bear in mind that rubisco can only act on carbon dioxide, but not on bicarbonate. So what I'm trying to say here is that there are several genes and several proteins and several factors that come into play. And these need to function, several cellular part participants need to function in a concerted synchronized manner to establish an efficient carbon concentration mechanism. Um, so our lab focuses on understanding the various molecular aspects that help establish CCM. And that is what my research revolves around. The question that many of you might ask is why study this phenomenon at all? Well, if we could engineer CCM into terrestrial crops, then we could increase their photosynthetic efficiency and their yields. This is one of the long-term goals of studying CCM for several research groups, including ours. But one must also bear in mind that this is a phenomenon that emerged more than 400 million years ago on Earth. And I think any phenomenon that has survived millions of years of evolution merits research and examination by us. So with that, I'd like to thank my advisor, uh, Professor Harvard Griffith, and members of the lab with whom I collaborate. I would also like to thank the funding bodies, CAP and Tigris, which pay for my research here at Cambridge. Thank you for your attention.